and they, they probably there are probably lots of them who have that feeling that we've done it. That wasn't the one more ravine. That wasn't the landing. They're not at the landing. The landing's not right there. So no, 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 no. Your military objective is not reached. And I'll tell you, um, as a kid, and I'm not saying it was from park rangers, but from other people, I've heard um, throughout my life, actually, that the Confederates won day one. No, not at all. The farthest from it. They won nothing. They didn't reach their military objective. They didn't do any of it. Yeah, they captured some guys. They happened on both sides. The prisoners from both sides. Now, if they're not reaching that military objective, anybody who wasn't mad at me be mad. They did not win day one. So they didn't reach that objective. And that's that's always my final thought like on a Grand Black Lion call. Um, so the, the parrot rifles, for a 10-pound parrot rifle, the maximum effective range is 1,850 yards. They don't need that really on the saddle. <laughs> um, when the Confederates do get to the hot, what I refer to as the high water mark here, um, that's only a few hundred yards from where we are. Right they don't need. But they're happy to have them. I'm glad they have. Them. But it's not necessary to have a weapon that great right here in this position. But they're here, and they've got everything they need. So all these um, artillery batteries, they're just going to line up. Actually, not even starting at the landing. They line up from a curved position around the landing. One of those over there is a Mark Graff battery, I believe, and Bunches battery, our guys from the Hornet's Nest that provided that enfilade fire across the field. But Bunches battery is around the curve, so when you're taking the drive into a route, um, you go down, you see the river, it's all beautiful, then you come up, and you go up to that area, Munch's um, battery, um, and the other artillery battery going to be around there. So anybody not captured, basically, ends up on Grant's Black Line. That's artillery and infantry. They all end up on Grant's Black Line. Now those awesome, um, I just forgot their, their name, uh, Burgess Sharpshooters, woo! Um, Burgess Sharpshooters have those Demic rifles um, that have their own bullet mold for each weapon. Um, those fellas are all the way out on the right, um, guarding the Union right flank. So, but this is a gradual buildup. Now, we also have um, some of Yule's armies going to land. That yellow plaque right there. You don't see many yellow day one plaques. Actually, they're all up here uh, in this area. But there's one right there. So that's some of Yule's army already landing. And let's walk over this. I'm actually cheating. I came over here to read the plaque to see who it was. I'm not going to lie. Um, I used to stand here all the time during the artillery demo. Uh, it's what I love about these. Because they're going to give you the, the simple facts. Now, D.W. Reed. Ah, I forgot to talk about him on the Hornet's Nest program. Which is cool because those of you who weren't there, they're going to get it. So, Major D.W. Reed, my wife, distant relative, I didn't know about until last year. I was like, ah! <laughs> And she's like, Reed, like that guy? I was like, yeah, the one that, yeah, that guy. Anyway. So um, D.W. Reed comes up with um, some stuff. They do a lot of research. They do, uh, they're using the official records. Um, some of us talked about that this morning, volume 10. The boring looking books in the library that you can't check out, volume 10, volume 10, volume 10. Um, but they're utilizing all of those. I actually um, saw the one that Atwell Thompson used to make those maps. I had a signature in there, I thought it was really neat. Um, but this is not an early park history talk, is it? So anyway. Um, what these guys are going to do, uh, like it says, um, uh, they show up at 6 p.m. That's their time. It's all well-researched. Um, and being a part of Nelson's division. Now, Nelson is an old, he's an old sailor who wants to come play Army. It sounded mean, but he wants to come <laughs> play Army. Um, he's, the, he's the guy, he rides off of the boat while on his horse. But, um, no, it's cool. He's, he's, he does fine. But uh, Nelson shows up, um, so they're already here. So like I said, the, the day one plaques shape like this. The day two plaques are going to be oval plaques, and we'll actually pass one of those. Because, and I, I don't get too far ahead of myself, meaning a day ahead. 
I'm doing the crittenin talk tomorrow, but um, but crittenin's men are all here. Um, they're either on the transports or about to get on the transports up in Savannah um, by midnight. So and they're here shortly after that. They standing around in the rain all night, but that's tomorrow's program, so I'm not going to get way ahead of myself. I wasn't kidding. All right, so this is where uh, these guys and they're going to get in line, but that's that's six o'clock. But at six o'clock, however. Um, since we're standing here, I'll go on and tell you at the at six o'clock is um, it's about that time that the Confederates actually get the high water mark, so they show up. Then, so that military objective of turning the Union left, or this last attempt on turning the Union left, so the purpose was to cut off the landing. Into the woods. Now, don't forget, we gotta look out for snakes. They're on the ground, by the way. That just happens to be Stone's battery. So, all the uh, the TP looking tents, the Sibley tents, that's what is all over the battlefield. Um, those, the, when you see those shelter halves that are buttoned together at the top, they're not issued out until the fall, sometime in the fall of 1862. So, not here at this battle. So, um, as far as federal stuff goes. Um, and any research that I've got, they don't come around later. Um, the tents that they are using all over the battlefield are those Sibley tents, which is why they're all in our film. They're in that painting of the 6th um, Mississippi that's on the uh, brochure. But that's what's here. Now when you're standing at one of these, you're standing at the head of the camp. Um, this is going to be the center of the camp. It would go to your left and then the right of the plaque and backwards as you're reading this. Um, so that direction. Well, when they're up here online, <laughs> The firing were right through their oh. tents um, to try to push back the uh, the attempt. So what I want to do right now, um, we're going to go that way. We're going to walk out in the woods a little bit um, to the edge of Jill Branch on that side, and then I want to come back and go down towards the Chalmers Black as well. It, it's really easy um, to kind of be able to see down into Bill Branch in this this mm -hmm. way. Uh, during all the flooding, I went down there. They're not warm like this. I wouldn't believe that snake. Uh, but I was down in the old ranch. Alright, let's walk down here. Alright, let's walk So Chalmers Brigade, you guys were just, some of you, I don't know how, if all or some, whatever. We're, uh, we're over there on the Union left flank, Confederate mm -hmm. right flank over there. Um, but Chalmers Brigade has been in those ravines a good bit. They've been moving around. Um, they're the brigade uh, on the very end of the line uh, as far as infantry soldiers. So on foot, that um, has really traversed so much over there. All the way over, uh, as well as Jackson's brigade. Um, so, 52nd Tennessee. Um, there, there's there's some really weird situations with the 52nd. Um, it's a it's a study uh, really to kind of think about for somebody maybe. Um, but with with the 52nd, um, a lot of the, a lot of those particular soldiers in this brigade, and you can see it's all Mississippi boys, so it's going to be tough on them anyway. Because different states. Come on, we got a rival. It's like SEC football around here. Um, I'm not a fan of either one of them. Um, but uh, just like that, actually, it's a really good comparison. Uh, SEC football is nuts. That's what we have um, around here. So uh, we won't get into that. Okay. Anyway, um, but uh, there, there is that, and that is a really kind of good way to, to put it. Um, I mean, they're not going to knock each other out. They're in the same army. They might knock each other out, but they're not going to kill each other necessarily because they are in the same army. Uh, but they are going to trash talk like nothing else. Now, so that's, that's already hard for the few seconds, I'm sure. But when they come into this battle, there are so many of those guys in the 50 second without any weapons whatsoever. So when I was a kid and we were reenacting um, 
they're uh, you know some reenacting weapons are expensive, um, and and they would they would say uh, we're just one of those soldiers that didn't have a weapon. This can't even be real. Where do you get it? <laughs> I actually even reenacted the picture segment sometimes. So ah, it was real. Um, and so the idea of well, you'll pick one up on the battlefield. Who's like? And you start thinking about your buddies. You're like, oh. Oh, they want me to, oh man, this is horrible. Or, yeah, the enemy, right? Let's be positive here. Yeah. So, um, that is the, the mentality. Not all of their regiments, some of them had uh, various sporting rifles, is the word I've read before. Um, hunting rifles, things like that. Shotguns and all that. Um, I've read accounts of pikes, uh, whether they were still carrying them at the Battle of Shiloh. Um, I can't be 100% sure, but um, tell you what you've got carry what you have. Um, so, they, uh, 52nd, early on, before, uh, before they even come in contact with Stuart's Brigade over there on the, on the left, meaning left, um, they, uh, they're, they're down Locust Grove Branch and up, which is south of the Tent Hospital site, south of Stuart's head. So they're over there, and there had been, um, a lieutenant went out, on a patrol to go find out where the dirty sea sash were. And so they go down um, and up that that um, Locust Grove branch, the ravine there. And when they get to the top, they notice some Confederates. They see an officer. And uh, it's actually guys from the 55th Illinois. And they had Dresden rifles as one of, I believe, three or one of a few regiments um, in the Civil War that were completely armed with Dresden rifles. I won't get into all the particulars on that. Um, although the nerd can talk about weapons forever, but um, they have Dresden rifles, and apparently this one fella, uh, this one kid, his rifle, um, it's to me it sounds like it wasn't the safety, which is which is half cocked on on mm -hmm. a, uh, those weapons, that the safety didn't work, maybe, um, or he had pulled it all the way back at that moment, and he's going to fire at that point and he just tapped the trigger or something because as he's about to level the weapon his officer told him to shoot that officer talking about an officer in the 50 second and he levels that weapon and before he gets it level it goes off 50 second tennessee is startled um all of the guys that were on that little patrol in the 55th illinois they all fire uh, their dresden rifles um towards the 50 second and those boys can daddle um or at least they get the heck back and out of the way but um, there are a lot of 52nd Tennessee guys who tank off. There's, as you see, it says two companies here. Um, I can't remember the other one, but I do know one of them. I believe it's Company T that does stick around. And they're actually intermingled. Um, in, well, not intermingled, but they're placed in between um, two Mississippi regiments, not put on the end. Um, but back to... To what they've been doing. They've been going through these ravines all day long, Chalmers Brigade and Jack's Brigade. They've been marching um, all the way over to the end of the line all day long. Um, they got held off by Stewart's Brigade for about two hours and 15 minutes, um, which Stewart's Brigade was half their size about. Um, that probably didn't make you feel good once you realize how small the unit was when you are able to push forward. And they do pretty much see Stewart's Brigade as they, as they crest that hill over there when they overrun them. But, um, but like I said, they've, they've been in these ravines all day. And by the time that the capture of the hornet's nest happens, which is around um, 530, um, the, like, we've only got an hour of daylight left at that time. So when uh, they do start heading towards the river, and then we'll head north once they get to the river, um, it's, it's their time's running out. Um, they basically have about a half an hour by the time they get there. Uh, we're going to go, um, and I'm going to read some quotes and stuff in a little bit, no quotes, but we're going to go down there. We're going to go to the edge of the ravine where I was going to take it down into, but we'll at least, at least get over there um, to where we can kind of see. We're of that deep ravine. So how far did these boys get now? Oh, I am so sorry. This is exactly where they get to, right here, right here. Um, and so we walked all the way back, all the way to this point. Um, and this is the distance. Now I'm going to tell you it is out of rifle. It's about around rifle range. Um, around that. The problem is um, not out of rifle. 
<laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. That is the point so, that should be made. So this is the high water mark? This is right the here? high water mark on the right flank. So, sure. so the amount of guys that appear left and right of the side. So, yeah, so just to mark. orient myself, mm -hmm. there's a ravine here. The ravine's behind you. Ravine. They've ravine. come through the ravine and up. Okay, so what is this ravine called again? This is the old branch ravine. Dill branch. Me. What is this right here? That's those are those are draws from the ravine. Draws. From yeah, the we've map. actually snaked around. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll show you a map real quick. So this is. Oh, uh, Jeff Gins's uh, map. Got you. <laughs> I have my own, but he told me not to use it, so I use it. Um, he, he says he's working for Well, he's wrong. That's great. All right. All right. So um, we're right here, Chalmers Brigade, right in this spot. So as you see, it snakes all over the place. Um, but so as we are, and I've got it oriented just right rivers that direction, we are on the north side of Dill Branch Ravine here, and we've come from Stone's Battery right here. Um, so that's where we entered, and we walked over here for a second and saw some of the draws there. Um, and now we're going to walk um, over to right here in this ravine, but we can see down there. So dumb question, what, <laughs> not, not, not being a geography okay. major, so what's the difference between a draw and a ravine? I mean, that looks like a ravine so the, to the, me. The, the draw is something that's spurring. Um, a spur or whatever. Right, or spur. Yeah, we, okay. Like, okay. Okay. Scout. Yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I learned everything I needed to know from my You're also making fire from here. What you, this is all treat. Oh, what are they firing? Yeah. I'll firing? touch on that in a second. It's good. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> You're going to hit trees. No, really nothing. Okay. They have no ammunition. Oh. Who has no? But they, 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 these boys have no ammunition. Jackson has no ammunition. So this grid. Jackson says, "Without ammunition, and nothing but our bayonets to rely on." So you're saying they're wandering, they're wandering around in these ravines yeah, all yeah. day. Well, like how, how long? Well, this day? afternoon. I mean, in the yeah, evening. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So There's once no supply coming up there. Absolutely no supply coming up there. As a matter of fact, the artillery that they do have, and you can see on this map, is Gage's artillery. Um, this attached to Chalmers, and they're on the other side of the ravine, so they're not going to go down enough. That's basically impossible mm -hmm. um, in this particular ravine. Um, so they are on the other side, but they come under fire quickly. Um, from right there. So they're getting from, in sight of absolutely. a whole lot of artillery yeah. right there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Some of them who can hit that, but so they've already been, that's something they've already sighted in prior to the battle. So on the right flank, this is as far as they go. Absolutely. This is the extreme right. This I've is the end of the line. Yeah. 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 20th man. <laughs> All right. Good job. Beautiful. Right. Although I look at the the Stewart Brigade is the end of the line. They got but no, just being able to see it, um, things are starting to bud. But um, that's still branch. But but the thing is, is we are in between these two brigades. Um, Jackson's brigade, uh, we'll walk a little bit further. But Jackson's brigade is, is making, um, their, their ravine is, is worse than the other ones we've seen. They're, the hill they're in. The guys that were over in the Peace Orchard, they're straight back that direction. Um, like 28th Illinois, 45th Illinois, but um, they're right back there. there. Um, the other regiment that are in that position. Uh, yeah, Lawman's Brigade that was part over there in the Peach Orchard. Um, Richardson's Battery, Schwartz Battery. Um, Williams Brigade should be at that point Pugh's Brigade because Williams has already been taken back in the beginning of the Peach Orchard fight. Um, so, yeah. And a couple more Iowa regiments on that area. Yeah. You're fine. I feel, I feel like uh, answer yeah. question, man. It's, yeah. it's totally fine. <laughs> this is how we do this. <laughs> All right, yeah. beautiful. So, how do, they access, so how, do they, how do they get here? How do they access? Where are they coming? They come down, and it is, it's beautiful when it's raining, but it is very uh, steep on the other side as well. They come straight down, um, and, uh, man, I wish I had done that, but they come straight down, um, and they, they go through, they're close, they go through thigh high water. I mean, it's just right, carrying on the flooding, um, but they went through thigh high water uh, when they went down and tried to get up um, Bill Brent's Ravine during that. During the flooding that we had recently, I did put a couple pictures on Facebook, uh, on our Facebook page um, at the park, just a few. Um, and those were taken from down in the ravine, just actually in front of where Chalmers, so right where Chalmers had gone down. Um, and, 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 but I didn't go through the water. But, um, but um, they're going to come straight down that ravine. 
Um, if they can find a, a draw, that'll make it easier yeah. to get down. Um, they it might be the lucky guy in that part of the line that sure. they come down um, in brigade and in brigade front. Uh, but just on the other side of there, and like I said, it's steeper. Um, and I do encourage people to come back uh, like winter, um, late fall, close to the winter, uh, and come out here in this area. You can see more, um, a lot further. You can see what they went through um, a lot better because you don't have to worry about those pesky little trees. Yeah, but this is the exact kind of year that they can't. Yeah, which is even worse for these guys. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Yeah, we're here on the right day. But oh, this yeah. position also gave the Confederates ample protection. Who, who's going to fire at them? Like the, oh, the artillery the, is firing at them. They know that this, they're here? They can see them. They could? Mm -hmm. At the time of the battle, this is this is clear. But this is clear shot, eyesight through it's, the trees. It's comparable to Mari's Heights or Little Round Top or... <laughs> it's an unbelievable defensive position. It, it, it is, but they do have some who make it down and yeah. up. It's not a lot, but there it is enough troops um, to give a uh, a sense of oh no. And let me give you something on that. Um, gotta find the right one. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, this lieutenant. Um, who was the acting adjutant in Buckland's brigade of Sherman's division? Um, he says uh, a rebel, a rebel yell fiercer than any I I I so far heard, and he's on the roof of the Texas pilot house, so one of the, the transport boats. Um, but he says they they yell repeated again and again, followed by even more thunderous discharges of artillery. The whole earth seemed to tremble. Now he's sitting on the roof on the boat on top of the pilot house. Um, and he's hearing this from the landing, coming from track of Chalmers' brigade and Jackson's brigade as they come down up. Um, this is that moment of Grant's last line when he's talking about this. Um, and, and, and so to, to, the, to the Union soldiers, there's no, oh, it's, it's, we're good. There's no, we're good. Because what is that first line? To them, it's just some soldiers. What's next? They're still coming. Are we they still going to fight this? They thing? don't know. That they have this. no idea that it's just right. these few brigades. Mm -hmm. So, uh, isolated, exactly. separated. Another quote from uh, George W. McBride of the 15th Michigan and Prentice, from Prentice Division. Um, he says, We are startled by a cannon shot above us. A signal for more. It is answered by a blinding flash, a mighty roar. It's like it's coming up. The earth trembles. Something strikes me, a darkness falls about me, smoke and leaves and twigs and gravel and earth fill the air. A start up frightened. It is Webster's great guns above us. Artillery along the line opens up. So that's at that very moment. Now, they do have the fear, but they also have this major belief in this line created by Colonel Webster Grant's last line of defense, especially after that artillery opens up because... Uh, now they've got their backed up. If they were some soldiers that may not have had enough artillery in one position or another, which um, at least they probably did, but either way, um, now they've got a whole lot of artillery. Um, a lot of artillery, plus only one of the gunboats was firing at this um, at that time. Here. Right. Yeah. Now, the, 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 it's interesting to think about the idea of a banking round, um, and I won't get too much into that, but... <laughs> The gunboats banking rounds um, through Dan Dill Branch Ravine, as you saw on that map. You saw <laughs> it, um, how it curves from the river. Um, so that one gunboat, uh, the gunboat will be firing here, and but right there, it takes that curve north, and then comes back. So that right there creates a major problem for the gunboat trying to do that. So it's a theory, and we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> I don't have a problem with the theory. I'm just saying we're going to leave it. Um, but that is something that, that is created as a problem. However, these guys are talking about those rounds coming through. The Confederates talked yeah. about those rounds. There is, the problem is, real quick, the, the one problem with the gunboat situation is that the guns are, um, the, where they're positioned on the gunboat is not, can't um, it's, it's not, elevation. they can't get the elevation that they need because the bluff over there is also very steep. Mm -hmm. So, um, that elevation is is a problem for them um, of, of the uh, bluff, so it's that's why there's a lot of can they do it? it would it happen? However, they talk about it. 
This account for a guy talking about a round bouncer. Now, time teases. He watches it bounce. This one guy, um, he said, I was so thankful. I was like praying, just keep going. Just keep going. And it kills one of his dogs in the room. So. This guy is on his side um, forever. I mean, to be, to know that, that and his faith is, is seemed really strong in the way he said it, but to know that he's ready to live when someone else dies. That's faith. Um, religious or not, it's faith. It doesn't matter, but he was. Um, so you have a situation like that, but but it also could have been a time fuse coming from, from other artillery, because remember, you've got that Mark Graff and Munch's battery around the curve over there, so that's enfilade fire. Um, some of us talked earlier about enfilade fire. It's, it's going to do this devastating effect because it's hitting from an angle rather than a straight shot. That's a couple guys. Um, this is possibly more. Um, it, it increases your chances greatly. So um, that's that's what they're that's that that is happening. The artillery is a major major problem for these men um, because <laughs> the exploding shells. They are this with great effect. Uh, the K shot. It was a time fuse meant to explode over the heads of the men. It takes out giant chunks of the lines. And, and back to the thing of that survivor's guilt that you never shake um, is, uh, is, is to know that that spherical K-shot, that K-shot when it explodes, it's, it's so random the way it throws that shrapnel. And there could be buddies all around you, either dead or, or, or wounded. And there's no scratches. But what you do leave with uh, physically, um, the shock waves from that mess up your body. Um, on the inside, your hearing, uh, ears will bleed, things like that. But to be that one guy or the one of the few guys standing there after that explosion, um, it's a demoralizing effect. Or you get major hate faith. Now you're ticked. Um, but it's still demoralizing, but you are ticked off, uh, generally, in a moment like that. Now, um, I don't want to keep um, pressing that too much, but um, with um, that, that time left, and like I said, Jackson says, uh, without ammunition and only our bayonets to rely on, what are you going to do? I mean, what else would you do, really, in that situation with no ammo? That sprint towards the enemy, what are you going to do? You're going to get a few guys. You're going to get one for one. And there's no, it's not one for one. It's not one for one. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, at that moment, uh, there's, there's a good 20,000, give or take, Union infantry, or more, actually, at that point. Um, actually, that was earlier on. So it's, it's building and building, like we talked about. Guys are coming back. Um, guys are being pressed up on the line. Um, in that situation, now there, like I said, there are guys huddled against the boat. That's one of those things that catches a lot of the um, that that bayoneting in the tent Smith yeah. stuff. Um, so is that? Um, it's not thousands upon thousands, but Crittenden does talk about the masses, and he probably overestimates. But his point about the masses um, is, you know, they're always trying to make their guys look better. Yes, but um, the thing about Crittenden is he didn't want his fresh soldiers who haven't been in combat yet to see that so he wants to put a regiment um on the landing to, so he's going to at least sacrifice the mentality of one regiment um as that goes but um he wants to do that but either way he gets off and there's a huge crowd of stragglers and get in wrong that's later in the evening like i said um that's after that 6 30 mark now um that moment of 6 30 eyes are adjusting uh jackson calls for withdrawal we head down uh, and back out. Um, Chalmers and he, Chalmers and Jackson, they, do move. They're talking. Um, they're saying we're done here. They are done. Let's go get um, a drink and uh, barbecue. And, uh, something like that. <laughs> so, General, um, this is uh, well. First off, before I get to that, because I'm gonna um, kind of give something an account from Tennessee's governor, who was the one that the guy that was with Albert Denny Johnston uh, when he died. I'm gonna give his account of what he says about the withdrawal. But before that, I want to give you one pretty gruesome account by Dr. Um, Forrest uh, Wardner, uh, the surgeon of the 12th Illinois uh, MacArthur's Brigade of the Mitchell Law Institute. He 
He says, I was working on a brave soldier whose right arm was maimed in a fearful manner. A citizen physician from Chicago who had uh, come up with the sanitary commission attempted to assist by administering chloroform. Just as he began, the rebel sharpshooters commenced firing at a battery Colonel Webster had planted between us and the enemy's lines to protect the landing. Every wounded man who, who, could, uh, who could move went scrambling over the bluff for protection. I saw one poor fellow whose leg had been amputated on his back, holding the stump of his limb um, and working his way over the edge of the bluff. He got behind the large oak tree and attempted to dressing uh, the, the uh, wounded limb. Um, just some of the, the confusion. You've you got a guy who's, who's he's got such a survival mentality. He's, he's got a sub um, uh, for a leg, and um, he it's, it's still his mentality. They lie, and over he goes, holding that that stump up. Um, now, I just want to read that because I thought it was amazing. I want to make sure I read all my own quotes here. Um, now, Tennessee's governor, Governor Isham G. Harris. Now, this is on the thing of. Um, he finds out that they're, that they're falling back. And um, there's a situation where he had told uh, Beauregard that he was going to go ride on the line and see the condition and such. Um, and all of a sudden, he sees Confederate troops falling back. He says, I instantly rode back to Beauregard and protested against the execution of this order to fall back. General Beauregard replied, Governor, you know as well as I do that these men... Uh, have been on the march or engaged in battle for the last 48 hours and half of them without oh on the march yeah sorry and half of them without rations for the last 24 the men have uh, the men must rest and or must have rest and refreshment it will take but a short time to finish up in the morning i urged that by morning we would find the enemy had been taken across the river by his gunboats and transports and that we would have this enemy to fight again. So that's that's Harris's idea of um, of the uh, trying to figure out why are we doing this. And you can kind of see from Harris's quote of Beauregard. Let's be clear about that. But from Harris's quote of Beauregard, um, you can see that um, that that Beauregard really might actually think that they've done it but what was the military plan that we've talked about all day to turn that right to get them away from the river cut off the reinforcements of Don capture Carlos Fuel and capture an army destroy that army it's capturing like, him is is the destroying same. it's the same thing exactly you're right so at that point, he says, we'll, we'll just, we'll finish it up in the morning. I just push, 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 push. And you can see the frustration of Governor Harris. Um, there's frustration of other officers all over this battlefield. Um, I'm not putting blame on... But is that Florida. realistic? I mean, is, for, is that realistic? Do they fight at night? You know, could they fight the... With no ammunition? I mean, people <laughs> with no ammunition? At yeah. night. So but, where's this guy? Where's but night fighting has happened. But, but, um, the, the, the thing, I think the question, the, the realistic part is, is it realistic to think that it's over at this point? Because he does get a lot of flack and a lot of stuff. So to continue to push, and, and what I mean by to continue to push in, in, in my mindset was, before that moment of 6.30, before the moment of 6 o'clock. Um, but but they, they, there's all these walls in the Confederate attack. Some of them are good, because he's got to recollect, reorganize, um, refit, oh, run water down the weapons like we talked about in the Hornet's Nest with all the black powder caking up on the inside of these barrels on the Union left. Um, not, not Stuart's brigades, but um, another brigade. They're actually slamming the weapons into the trees. Or, or there's, a, there's a story of a guy having to do this, mm -hmm. to slam the weapon in the tree to get the ramrod to put the round all the way down. I'm guaranteeing you, you are probably getting that ramrod stuck as well, or there's a good mm -hmm. chance of it. If that happens, it's going down range, and now you can't load and fire anymore. So some of those lulls of, of cleaning weapons, running water down, this is normal. It happens a lot. So some lulls are good. That one lull where they're capturing 
the guys left in the hornet's nest? There's even stories of some guys, they leave their regiment because they know about it going on. And they want to go see some dirty ladies and go see these prisoners. Because some guys might even, and I'm sure, have this mentality that we did it. We've captured these men here. We've got them. We even got the general, did we? Who? Who is it? And so there's all this spreading throughout the lines. We capture boys, and some guys leave their regiments, like I said, just to go see these prisoners. Some are trying to get their weapons as those prisoners are surrendering in a hornet's nest and they're slamming their weapons against trees to try to break them. Um, and they're being shot while they're trying to do it, even. Or story of Jacob, could be true. But um, that's one of those lulls. It's too much. It's, it's too much time because. Um, and they, they probably, there are probably lots of them who have that feeling that we've done it. Um, but that wasn't the one more ravine. That wasn't the landing. They're not at the landing. The landing's not right there. So no, 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 no. Your military objective is not reached. And I'll tell you, um, as a kid, and I'm not saying it was from park rangers, but from other people, I've heard um, throughout my life, actually, that the Confederates won day one. No, not at all. The farthest point. They won nothing. They didn't reach their military objective. They didn't do any of that. Yeah, they captured some guys. It happened on both sides. There's prisoners from both sides. Now, if they're not reaching that military objective, anybody want to be mad at me, be mad? They did not win day one. So they didn't reach that objective. And that's that's always my final thought like on the Grand Slide Line. It's like winning the first half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if they really won the first half. <laughs> they just did well. They did very well. Yeah, absolutely did well. They got this far. It is. It actually, and this is, that's a good point. They really do well. And what they've done is now they've woken up the Union armies. Um, we need to fight. There are things we need to change. And there are lots of things um, from so many commanders throughout this battlefield that end up being that change that is for the better um, throughout the war. Um, I look at Sherman that way. I look at so many people that way. Um, so, Grant, Grant. absolutely. Okay. So, Grant, this was a, this was a close call. Mm -hmm. It was. And Grant passed. Now, I'm going to talk about the whole Howley situation. Because I'm going to... Whole what? Nothing. Alex. That's a whole. Nothing. That was politics. Oh yeah, but that's a whole. Nother.